Well, welcome back to this uh, next part of the colon cancer video. Now, today we're going to be looking at this paper here from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Rates of colorectal and other cancers are rising in young adults, as are other cancers. And we'll also be looking, asking the question, is it plausible that mRNA vaccines are an etiological factor in uh, colon cancer, particularly in cancers in general? Uh, We'll be looking at that in, in, in a little bit of detail. If you haven't got time to watch this video, the bottom line is, yes, I believe there are plausible mechanisms of action, which, of course, are an essential part of the Bradford Hill criteria. Anyway, let's look at what we've got specifically here. This, this is this paper here. Rates of uh, colorectal and other cancers are rising in young adults, puzzling researchers. Just a little bit from this paper. Um, now, to be fair, this paper is from uh, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, so um, it doesn't... Should we just say it doesn't speculate too much? But that's the link anyway. Incidence of 14 cancer types increased among younger people uh, under the age of 50. So increasing in 14 cancer types in younger people. Uh, this, of course, is very concerning. Uh, nine of those cancer types, including colorectal cancer and breast cancer, also increasing in some over 50s. So we're getting some cancers increasing uh, in the under 50s, sadly, uh, and some of those also increasing in the over 50s. There are some cancers, of, actually, where the incidence is going down. So th there's a shift here, quite what is happening. We're hoping to get down to some more of that in a minute. Uh, uh, factors, is it just increased diagnosis? No, I don't think so. Many early onset colorectal cancers are diagnosed after symptoms. So... Um, people are reporting symptomatic cancer now in this paper here and your son Ca cancer surveillance research american cancer society says this given that similar trends have been observed in the u.s and many other countries so this is a global phenomena uh, around western countries uh, it's crucial for researchers to address how much of this is driven by shifts in risk factors versus change in diagnostic practices uh, I think it's a change in diagnostic practices. Practice, uh, I think I don't think it's diagnostic practices. Um, we are diagnosing more, but I think there's something else going on in the etiology of this. Now, National Bowel uh, Cancer Audit Group in the United Kingdom, uh, 2024 report. That's it there. Uh, England and Wales. There was uh, 35,779 patients diagnosed with. Um, bowel cancer and th this is just to show that uh, between 2017 2018 there's more being diagnosed at an early stage which of course is good uh, because 42 percent being diagnosed at an early stage means they're much more treatable now interestingly um the tw that's the 2024 report the 2025 report didn't actually give the total number of cases it shows a similar change in uh, early diagnosis but the number is actually uh, 38,604 new patients. So to summarise, new diagnosis of colorectal cancer, England and Wales, 2021 to 2022, 35,779. 2022 to 2023, uh, 38,604. So we do see, sadly, uh, really quite a big uh, statistically significant uh, increase in uh, new diagnosis of bowel cancer in England and Wales. A little more detail just before we look at mRNA. Um, by October 2020, monthly diagnosis had returned to pre-pandemic level. So this is not it's none of these effects that people talk about, that it's just lack of people not turning up for treatment during the pandemic. That's, that's passed. From April 2021, the numbers of monthly diagnosis continue to rise. So from April 2021, uh, so that's what, few months into the vaccine rollout the numbers of monthly diagnoses continue to rise now of course this is a correlation we're not saying it's causal what we are going to look at though is plausible mechanisms um, it is it is worth bearing in mind that uh, in causality there will always be correlation but correlation doesn't always equal causality as we as we know um the total number of patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer during 2021-2022 surpassed the annual figures prior to the pandemic. Now, um, we don't know too much about these patients, unfortunately, from the UK data. Um, but these are the number of patients. So, uh, 
female, interestingly, um, yeah, ma- 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 male, it was uh, 56%, female, 44%. Okay, I, I don't, probably, I can't really think of a quick reason for that, really. Probably more men have smoked in the past. Maybe drink, men drink more alcohol. Um, um, but not a massive difference, really, between sexes. But the age is here. Um, we are given this. This Now, this, sadly, this is the 2024 data from the 2024 report. So age group under 50s. It was uh, six point four percent of diagnosis. Uh, Fifty to fifty nine, eleven point three percent of diagnosis. These are the total number of cases. Sixty to seventy four, we see the numbers going up. So they're the most common. We see that's the most common age range. Now in the UK, uh, actually, it gets slightly less common as, as you get older. Um, now in the UK, we did used to start screening for bowel cancer at the age of 60 it's now down to 54 i think we screen between 54 and 75 now in the uk it's just a simple poo test basically fecal occult blood sort of sample it tests for chemical signatures of blood in in the stool which is a really good idea to do that the 2025 report so sadly where here what i was hoping to do is is look at the uh, increase in the under 50s it was 6.4 percent but the 2025 report and this is from the national bowel cancer audit in the uk didn't give the number of under 50s so uh this data is actually missing in the new report which is is really quite unfortunate we really could do with this data uh updated for the latest figures but we don't have it 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 was missing from the 2025 report so um a bit disappointing there from the report writers um check it out for yourself there's the references now what i want to come on to now is is it plausible that um messenger ribonucleic acid vaccines are are leading to some cases of um cancers and bowel cancers in particular so i've just picked up the criteria here causality may be adjudicated by larger scale associations Uh, consistent between countries where other explanations are unlikely where the effect follows the cause so it's cause followed by effect where greater exposure causes more harm with a plausible biological mechanism with coherence between bench sites and epidemiological data supported by even limited experimentation by analogy to other uh, causes of harm and sometimes by reversibility so it's very important we have the bench science uh, in place, the, the plausible mechanisms. And um, th- th- here's some potential mechanisms via which mRNA could be leading to cancers. And these are currently described as theoretical mechanisms. First is DNA integration. Um, genetic information from our mRNA vaccines getting into host, my, your DNA. Um, is this plausible? Um, <clears throat> mRNA fragments um, get into the cells, of course. Um, then there's reverse transcriptase. So this is the enzyme that can convert uh, mRNA into DNA. Um, so normally in a cell, of course, there's the process of transcription where DNA becomes RNA, which makes the proteins. But the RNA can go back via reverse transcriptase and make <coughs> make DNA, changing the DNA of the host cell potentially. And if there's a change to the DNA of the host cell, what we call a change to the DNA uh, in a cell is a mutation. So if that's happening, it's causing mutation. Of course, cancer is caused by a mutation. So the mechanism there is plausible. Potentially disrupting tumour suppressor genes. So tumour suppressor genes are with those which suppress excess cell division uh, or uh, activating genes, oncogenic genes, oncogenes, increase the likelihood of um cancers occurring so it's quite reasonable to ask well i can see why we've got tumor suppressor genes but why the heck have we got uh, oncogenes why on earth would, would should we have genes that uh, seem to be designed to increase the likelihood of cancer well of course these are the genes that were active when we were fetus to to to, uh, to, to produce the body or when we were children to to produce the body uh, it's just a problem when they go on working because we want cell division when we need it but then now in the adult form we don't really want too much cell division if there's too much that can lead to uh, malignancy 
cancer. So it's plausible. Uh, DNA contamination integrated into the genome. I think this is plausible. Um, I've talked to quite a few leading scientists who uh, assure me that there are plausible mechanisms for this. Uh, the slam dunk information is not there at the moment. Um, can't think why it wouldn't be in the public domain. Um, but the mechani mechanism is plausible. It's, that's the whole point. It's plausible. Uh, contamination uh, in vaccine products. So Pfizer, we know, uh, contained uh, modified RNA uh, vaccine. And it also contained the SV40. That's actually a DNA uh, contaminant. And the uh, the SV40 contaminant, we know this from uh, talking to uh, David Speaker, who did the primary work in the uh, in Canada, who found SV40, simian virus 40 contamination. So the simian virus is the DNA that can uh, inactivate tumor suppressor genes. So if you think about it, the tumor suppressor genes is normally suppressing the tumor. <coughs> um, if you inactivate the tumor suppressor gene, for example, uh, one called P53 and one called RB, if they're inactivated, then the tumours are not suppressed, so the tumours can go uh, on and develop, promoting unchecked cell growth. So again, the theory uh, makes, makes sense. This, this is biologically plausible. This is not implausible. <laughs> um, this is not ludicrous conspiracy theory. These are plausible biological mechanisms. Um, Prolonged spike protein expression. Now, sadly, uh, in the vaccines, they had this uh, one methyl pseudouridine modified mRNA. So the uridine, of course, is one of the bases in the RNA, <clears throat> and the incorporation of this pseudouridine. So it's not the natural uridine that we would like. It's a false one. It's it's a biologically manipulated one, and that means the the, the uh, mRNA hangs around for longer. And we know that spike protein has been detected in patients after vaccination. From memory, we looked at one study where it was 700 days. To me, there's only two real mechanisms where the spike protein could be going on being produced for 700 days. One is the reverse transcriptase, that it's in our genes, which is probably the worst possible scenario. And the other is this uh, pseudouridine allows the RNA to last for a long, long, long time inside our cells. Either way, spike protein can be going on being produced for long periods of time, which is not what we want. So rather a reckless experiment, in my view, to put that into the mRNA vaccines, but it was done and it's still there as far as I know. Um, encoding sars coronavirus 2 spike protein so the protein could be being produced over a long period of time. Another possibility <coughs> is that lipid nanoparticles could be delivered to stem cells. Now, the stem cells are the cells from which other cells are produced. So you'll have a stem cell uh, and that will divide and it will produce another stem cell. And the other one that divides goes on and produces a population of other cells. It could be anywhere. It could be in the liver. It could be in the, uh, could be in the skin. Uh, could be the blood. Um, so stem cells, um, if, if, the, if there's a genetic change in the stem cells, that can be uh, passed on, basically. It's basically a, a progenitor cell. That can be passed on through many generations of cells onto, onto future stem cells. And now we know that the mRNA uh, lipid nanoparticle the mRNA in the lipid nanoparticles goes everywhere around the body. Uh, we were deceived about that. We now know it goes everywhere. Of course, it's completely plausible that it could go to stem cells. It could go to any cell. Any cell. So completely plausible that it could go to... Um, uh, what do you call them? The uh, stem cells. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Right, so sustained spike protein production will lead to chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation, of course, can lead to cancer, disrupting cellular repair mechanisms leading to cancer. And, and this is kind of an axiom that, um, you know, it's so well known that chronic inflammation leads to cancer. A chronic inflammation from human papillomavirus in the cervix. Chronic inflammation from uh, gastroesophageal research di di disease in, in the esophagus. This, this is well known. Um, chronic inflammation in the colon from Crohn's or colitis causing colon cancer. Uh, another plausible mechanism, uh, immune suppression or dysregulation, molecular mimicry. So it could be that some um, molecules on cells have a similar shape to the antibodies that are produced in response to the spike protein. They will, therefore will start beating up 
on the uh, the body's own proteins. So if a vaccine stimulates a particular antibody, that antibody, yes, it can attack the protein which it was designed to uh, attack, but it can also attack um, proteins on cell surfaces which look similar. It's called molecular mimicry. They, so sometimes they can be almost identical. And uh, it basically starts beating up on our own tissues. This is autoimmune disease. Uh, and that leads to inflammation, and inflammation, as we know, leads to it can lead to cancer. Alteration of regulatory T cell function. So um, you get T uh, suppressor cells uh, and you get T helper cells. If they're dysregulated, that can potentially allow pre-existing cancers to progress. Um, we know that T cell immunity, <coughs> T lymphocyte immunity is totally vital. We learned this from Professor uh, Dalgleish and Professor Clancy. Um and we know that Professor Dalgleish invented a uh, simple bacterial preparation that can boost T cells that was submitted to the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency who refused to license it, which is a pity because I would like it because I would like my T cells up upgraded. Um, but I'm not allowed it. N neither are you. Outrageous that this isn't allowed to be prescribed uh, compassionately after Professor Dalgleish went to all the bother of developing it and collecting data on it. Um, really is a, a major loss to humanity and probably more specifically to me and you as well. Um, anyway, so that's, again, completely plausible mechanism. If, if, the spike, uh, if the spike protein shares epitopes with tumour suppressor proteins, for example, so epitope is the part the immune system recognises as being foreign, if they're on a tumour suppressor proteins, those proteins will be beaten up by the antibodies. Therefore, the tumour suppressor proteins will be depressed themselves. Therefore, the tumour suppressor proteins will not be free to suppress uh, tumours. So, uh, plausible bio biological mechanisms. Because of those biological mechanisms, uh, we should plug that in, as it were, into the, the Bradford Hill idea, all these mechanisms. Um, but, of course... We don't have the national level data in most countries that can, allows us to compare vaccinated with unvaccinated people or indeed the gradated risk with increased number of vaccines. So um, I will call for that data to be released so that a Bradford Hill analysis can be done and then we'll know. But are there plausible biological mechanisms? I think in this video we've demonstrated that yes, this is there are plausible biological mechanisms that need further investigation. Um, can't imagine the British government's going to be paying for those. Can't imagine big farmers going to be paying for those. So may not be done. We may never know. Until it becomes patently obvious in the future. And by that time, all the people that are making the decisions now will have been retired or died. The blood, the infected blood scandal in my U, in the UK only came out. It started in the 1980s and the report was only last year. Was it last year or the, early this year? Last year, I think. So uh, 80, like 30, 30 year gap. So younger viewers will get the definitive information maybe in 20 or 30 years. Now I hope I'm being over cynical and we know before that. But um, so many things are covered up. Sadly, we, we might never know the truth, which of course in my view is totally outrageous. There you go. We're just pawns in the game. More important people know what information we're allowed and what we're not allowed. We won't get mad. We'll leave it there. Thank you for watching.